so this video is about machining copper and making a dovetail vise to facilitate that. Uh, typically, I machine most of my work with a self-centering vise like this. Uh, with copper, it kind of made sense to move to a dovetail vise. One of the main reasons is the amount of grip stock necessary. So with a dovetail vise like this, I only need 1.5 millimeters of grip stock, where with a Lang self-centering vise, I need 3 millimeters minimum. And that doesn't sound like a huge difference, but the parts I was working on in this most recent run were right on the boundary of having to go up to the next stock size. So by using a little bit less grip stock, I didn't have to jump up another stock size. And in terms of dollars per year, that, that justified making a, a fixture just to do these. The other issue with the dovetail vices versus regular vices is regular vices you don't typically have to do a prep operation. The stock goes right in the vise and you clamp it. Um, that's not always the case with copper. Copper has a extruded radius sometimes if you get it in extruded bar format and that radius can be big enough that you can't clamp directly on those corners. And so you have to do a prep operation just to be able to clamp it in the vise. And so if that's the case, there's really not a downside to using a dovetail. You're doing a prep operation either way. <clears throat> so uh, we'll go through uh, kind of the idiosyncrasies of machining copper and uh, making a dovetail vise. And uh, you might be wondering, what's a guy who primarily focuses on uh, hard metals and die making doing with copper in his life? And the answer is most of the the die projects I'm involved in have some form of resistance welding. It could be like a, a silver contact resistance welded onto the part, or it might be two strips of dissimilar metal getting fused together to make a bimetallic switch. So we, we do see a fair amount of copper, and uh, it is something I've had to get good at working with over the years. Um, the actual cutting of it isn't really that challenging. Um, it's like most non-ferrous alloys, but it is slightly uh, abrasive. It does wear the, the keenness of the edge down. The, the thing to watch out for is the internal stresses. Uh, and we'll go over that and show some examples of how some of these stresses play out. So I uh, hope you get something from this, and thank you for watching. This is the dovetail fixture mounted on the Eroa chuck. It's 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters at its base. The width of the dovetail is 14 millimeters, and then it uses a 6 millimeter dowel in the center to keep the dovetail from shifting. If we cross section it, we could see that the clamp has an angle at the base, and that's to prevent the clamp from being lifted up as well. As you torque the clamp down on the dovetail, that lower angle also holds it more secure. This is the locating blade on the Aroa chuck. You can see how it interacts with the, the flexure spring on the Aroa pallet. Uh, it just kind of accumulates any air. So here are two blanks. One is drawn. You can see that edge radius I was talking about earlier. And the other is saw cut. And you can see how big that edge radius is. This is that edge radius sitting in a Lang vise. And you can see it, it's just barely going to grip. And so you would have to kind of sharpen that corner up. Here's a good example of stresses in material. The red part represents our copper, and the rubber bands represent the stress on the drawn surface from work hardening. So if we cut one surface, the other stressed surfaces cause it to buckle up. If we cut another surface, it gets even worse. But if we make it our procedure to cut all four surfaces in a roughing operation it removes all the stress from the skin of the part and then we can go in and do our finishing and then we end up with a very flat and square part so i set this demo up just to kind of illustrate how these stresses act from one side we've removed quite a bit of material and then a, a substantial amount from the core of the part. And this is a realistic representation of one of the parts I make a lot. Um, and we're using an uncoated three-fluid end mill just to kind of keep cutting stresses out so we're not seeing any work hardening. But you can see before cutting, I 
ground the top and bottom flat and parallel. And then after cutting that, the bottom bowed about 7 tenths. So that just gives you an idea of what we're fighting. Here is the base of the dovetail fixture. To make anything ROA compatible, you just really have to add a couple very basic holes. There's some M5s, a clearance hole, a 10 millimeter pool stud hole, and then two four millimeter dowel holes for locating the flexure. And it's quite easy, you could do it manually. Um, we just have all the tools already set up so I can make anything into a, a row of fixture very quickly. Once I have the the backside ready for the Aroa pallet, the rest of the machining is done on the Aroa chuck. So after machining those holes in the bottom, I'll set that bottom face down on the magnet and just dust a temporary datum flat on the opposite side. And we're doing this so I have something to work to when I'm trying to get all four feet to a planer. Then we can flip the part over and run the opposite face just so our flexure is sitting on a nice flat surface. Once this face is ground up we can install the, the Aroa flexure bases and then uh, the four feet and torque them down. One of the things I think that gets overlooked with the Aroa system is how cheap it is to build small pallets. Uh, when you compare it to other zero-point systems, it's easily the cheapest hardware around, and uh, it's some of the better performance as well. It's just these two stamped plates do the bulk of the locating, and then the four feet hold the stamped plate in place, and then the pool stud, which doesn't have to remain on the... the uh, fixture, it can go to another fixture when it's not in use, it, uh, it holds it down to the chuck. But uh, for, I don't, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, you can, you can make any piece of metal a, a row of pallet, and it's, uh, all the locating surfaces are hardened metal, and it, it works out very well in my opinion. Uh, I use it a lot for making mini tombstones, but after after you get them screwed down, I just ink them up so when we transfer over to the grinder, we can see when we have all four feet coplanar. This is one of like the mini tombstones I'll make a lot. I'll just put that bolt pattern on the back of a chunk of aluminum and then stick it in the fourth. So, back on the grinder, and we'll just dust a few tenths off until all four feet are coplanar. It usually doesn't take much. We're also trying to maintain a height from the base to the top of the feet that Aroa suggests. Um, and it usually comes right in, no issues. And then we'll just check uh, for parallelism, make sure nothing weird happened, and then we'll just do a little wiggle check real quick, make sure it's not rocking on its feet. And uh, it's looking like it's sitting pretty stable, so all we need to do now is typically put the pool stud in and then can go right into one of our Aroa chucks. But I'm going to be using a slightly different Aroa chuck to machine this, one that doesn't require a pool stud. It itself threads into the M10 uh, hole. This is like a EDM block they call it, but it's really nice in the mill as well. You can kind of flip the part around in a vise or magnet. So uh, we just stick that whole assembly in and uh, we'll, we'll rough out and finish it in this orientation and then flip it on its side to cut the uh, pocket features. Uh, it, you could have done the side work on the fourth axis, but uh, I just wanted to show how if you're going to be in the Aroa work holding system, one of these blocks is worth having around, especially if you do surface grinding.
After it's all roughed out, I just start finishing with a bull nose uh, inserted finishing solution I have. Uh, it puts a really nice finish on, but it does take a little bit of while. Uh, most of the time when I'm doing work like this, it's a Saturday, so I don't worry. And then the last thing I had to do in this orientation was cut the dovetail. Uh, to my surprise, I didn't own any carbide dovetail cutters. All I had was this kind of uh, junky high-speed steel one, but it did what I needed it to do. So, but now that I'm cutting dovetails for work holding, I did invest in some nicer carbide tooling. And then we'll cut that pocket square and get the tool radius out of the corner. And then the, the very last thing we have to do in this orientation is drill and thread two, two holes for the clamps. So next we'll start machining the clamps. Um, nothing too crazy, it just has these angled faces. Um, that's what, what does the locating. And we're just gonna do all those weird angles on the fourth axis and tab them out. I like the, the tab out methodology for little parts like this. It does leave a little tiny line from the tab, but with the surface grinder, I just stick them down on the grinder and touch off that blemish and it goes away instantly. So it's a very nice uh, approach for me and all the steel parts I have. Since a lot of my stock is uh, either one inch or three quarter inch material, I use these slotted holders a lot just for a very, very cheap, effective way of holding on to them. And they're they're a little bit smaller than a vise, so uh, you give up a little bit of material just to hang on to it. But I'll stick a pretty large slab of material in these and just kind of whittle parts off of it, and uh, it works out pretty well for what I do. Uh, really cheap work holding and very secure.
All right, and the very last thing we'll do is cut them down to a very narrow tab that we can break off, and then these are done. And we can put the E4 dovetail fixture together and uh, get machining on the copper. So we'll have to set up our vertical base again. Uh, and this is just a artifact that you center and touch off in Z, and that's kind of where you register the, 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 the base. Uh, and this is how the, the dovetail goes on. Uh, there's just a slot in the middle that the dowel pen registers in. And then the, the slot pops in there and the, the clamps secure it. And it uh, doesn't really take much torque. So once it's secured to the fixture, you could transfer the fixture from from base to base, or chuck to chuck. Um, the one on the table is pneumatic, and the one on the fourth axis is a manual. Uh, both work equally well, in my opinion, for what I do. But the, uh, the manuals are a little bit cheaper. And so here we are. We have it all roughed out. Now we're drilling these long cooling holes in it. Uh, and so by doing all the hole making and the rough milling, first and then going through and doing all the fine detail work we allow all that stress all the tension those rubber bands we allow them all to come off and uh, when we go and kiss off our final dimensions there's really no stress and material movement to worry about and you end up with a extremely flat stable part And so the very last thing we'll do to it before it leaves the mill is just go through and uh, skin cut all the faces. And yes, I realize this is effectively a poor man's fifth axis. Uh, I do want a fifth axis, but uh, I'm limited in size of my shop, so this has to work for now. And so when that's done, you just have to remove the dovetail and your part's complete.